uh, we'll move on to our next speaker, who is uh, David Van Valen, uh, Professor of Biology and Biological Engineering at Caltech. And um, take it over, David. Uh, so first, I'd just like to say thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, this has been a great day so far. Um, all the talks have been amazing. And if I had known that I was going to be at the end of so many excellent talks, I, I probably would have declined the invitation to speak. Um, the the um, work that's been pr presented today has been uh, quite uh, quite thought provoking. Um, so today I'd like to talk about the work my lab has been doing on adapting deep learning methods for doing single cell analysis of images. And I'll try to see if I can relate some of what we do uh, into, um, into the interpretability theme that's been uh, you know, talked about today. And so the title of today's talk is, is Single Cell Biology in a Software 2.0 World. So yeah, um, it's you know, unless you've been living under a rock, uh, you know that um, artificial intelligence and deep learning methods have just transformed uh, our relationship uh, with data. And I'd say that's particularly true uh, with imaging data. Um, so in the life sciences now, uh, there are deep learning methods that can do a wide number of tasks with different types of uh, biological imaging data. Um, so these include uh, identifying cells and images, a task called cell segmentation, um, uh, tracking objects, um, so cell tracking, um, being able to identify spots and single molecule uh, fish images, uh, restoring noise images, and then there's also this domain called augmented microscopy, um, which is trying to uh, from label free images, trying to predict what fluorescence images uh, might have looked like had you actually captured them. Uh, and so these range of methods are really just changing our relationship uh, with imaging data. And so some of the citations uh, that uh, that these figures are drawn from are shown here on the bottom uh, on the bottom on the bottom right. And so while these methods are really uh, are really nice and are letting people do uh, new things, I think the reality is is that for biological imaging. Um, as far as the impact the deep learning methods have had, you know, we're not quite where uh, the rest of society is. Um, and I would say in particular, uh, that's due to one reason, um, and that's data. Um, and so right now we're living in what I like to call the Tico Brahe era of AI powered uh, biology. And what I mean by that is as following. Um, so, uh, Johannes Kepler is a famed astronomer. Um, everybody learns about him and his laws of uh, planetary motion uh, during freshman physics. Uh, you know, orbits of planets are ellipses, equal areas are get, get swept out in equal time and whatnot. Uh, what's less appreciated are the contributions of Kepler's mentor, Tycho Brahe. So Tycho Brahe was also um, a steam astronomer. And what he did was he collected um, and kept meticulous notes on the locations um, uh, locations and trajectories of the planets and stars uh, literally compile over decades. Um, and so while Kepler is more famous and highly celebrated, it's really this data-centered effort that Tycho Brahe undertook of doing curation, uh, collection, curation, annotation that enabled this generation um, of knowledge, of knowledge and insight. Um, and I'd say when it gets to interpretation, uh, I, this is what I believe is this biological imaging field um, is missing um, are these large annotated um, data sets. Interpretation can come about through many ways. Uh, it can come about through developing uh, you know, specific uh, domain specific machine learning methods. They could come about through developing uh, methods for interpreting uh, black box model models. But another way it can come about is just by capturing uh, the knowledge of, um, of domain experts in the form of labels and labeled data, and then using that to train, um, to train, uh, to develop, uh, to develop models. Um, and so, it's really this this phase that we're in. And so, because we don't have these large annotated data sets, um, you know, the field is sort of stuck, um, so to speak, as far as what we're able to get the machine learning methods to do um, and practice on real data. Um, and so part of what we think is necessary um, is to actually go through um, big data, not around. If the challenge is we don't have enough labeled data, then rather thinking about, okay, well, how can we get around this? Um, instead, think about, okay, well, how can we generate the labeled data that we need? Um, and I'd say like we have some ideas of what uh, a, such a collection would look like. Um, there's likely going to need uh, 
there's likely going to be a need to, um, you know, have some aspects of, you know, the parts list variation, um, and also spatial temporal variation of biological uh, systems. And so automatically, like that puts you in the space of images. And then as far as the labels themselves, there's almost certainly going to be a need for dense pixel level labeling, um, and then also having the labels respect single cell resolution, because single cells are the fundamental unit. Um, of living matter. And so an example of what I'm talking about is we're shown here um, in this movie. Uh, so here we have side by side um, on the right uh, is a uh, live cell imaging movie of a cell undergoing cell division. Uh, so DNA is stained in red and microtubules are stained in green. And so there you already have uh, sort of like the parts list information um, in the data set. Um, because it's a movie, you have the uh, both the spatial and temporal variation, and then paired with it on the on the uh, on the left is a um, schematic of um, of cell division um, mitosis that was created by the cell biologist Walter Fleming in 1882, um, and so. Uh, it actually used to be quite commonplace before we attached uh, cameras and microscopes for folks to be able to, for folks to generate uh, movies, uh, sorry, uh, annotation, well, I'm saying annotations. Um, used to be quite common for people to generate schematics like this. And part of the reason why I like showing this movie, um, so one is it does illustrate like what's necessary, but two, it's a little poetic um, because it's sort of saying that, you know, in order for us to go to or for the life sciences to get to its future, you know, it's sort of have to visit, um, visit, visit, visit its past. Um, so these data challenges are quite are quite substantial. And it's sort of the focus um, of this talk today. Um, I will add that that's not all. Um, and so, in addition to these data challenges, uh, there are challenges in the model space, and then also challenges in the computational infrastructure space. And the term software 2.0 is really meant to call attention to the fact uh, to all of these challenges. Um, if you want to, at least in our in our view, if you want to actually develop these uh, machine learning systems that can be used on in real time and real biological data sets, uh, you need to be looking at all three of these different areas, uh, the data sets that power the models, uh, what the models themselves look like, and then also the computational systems for deploying these models um, in the different settings. Uh, folks need to be working on all three of them and ideally um, at the same time in an integrated fashion, uh, rather than working on um, any individual one um, in, a, in a siloed fashion. Okay, uh, so with that said, um, I would like to tell you about one story um, that's come out in our lab, um, and this is at this intersection of data and models, and so it features contributions from, I'd say, most uh, uh, almost our entire lab, um, but I just want to highlight a few individuals. Uh, Eric Mullen and Geneva Miller are a, a postdoctoral fellow and a research technician who've uh, spearheaded a lot of the work that, you, that you're going to see today. Um, Noah Greenwald is a graduate student at Stanford uh, who collaborated with us to generate these data sets. Um, and uh, Morgan Schwartz and Emily Laubscher are two graduate students um, in our lab who's made some substantial contributions to what I'm about to show you today as well. Um, and then also uh, Tom Dougherty and uh, Will Graff are two software engineers um, who, work in our, uh, who work in our lab and have really gone above and beyond uh, to make sure that the uh, algorithms we generate actually get turned into useful software for packages, um, not just Jupyter notebooks um, that live in the GitHub. Okay, um, so this part centers on single cell analysis, uh, which is a significant challenge for tissue imaging experiments. And so there are new technologies now uh, that let you image tissues uh, in such a way so that you can look at literally dozens of different proteins, other concentrations, and the locations um, at the same time in the same specimen. Uh, the details of how these technologies work isn't that important, um, but they roughly come to two flavors. Uh, one of them it does imaging using mass cytometry. Um, and so here you have antibodies that are uh, conjugated to metal ion labels, and you image by uh, um, by scanning an ablative beam over a stained sample, and then sending um, you know sending the um, the part that was ablated off to a mass spectrometer. Uh, the other class of methods uh, do iterative uh, staining, imaging, and destaining um, with light. It turns out you have to do one of those two things to get around the problem of spectral overlap um, that happens when you're imaging with light that limits you to looking at uh, three to four colors um, at any given time. Um, so again, the details aren't uh, aren't, so, aren't that important, uh, but what is it about what uh, the upshot is that you, at the end of the day, you're able to collect, you know, these 30 to 40 color images of biological samples where each uh, color corresponds to some biologically meaningful variable. Um, so shown here on the bottom 
um, on the bottom left is an example of such a data set. Um, so here we have uh, data from four different patients uh, who had triple negative breast cancer um, and, their, and their tumors were profiled um, in this fashion. And so what you can see is that there are seven, seven different uh, quote unquote colors being displayed, um, each one measuring something um, biologically different. Um, so double-stranded DNA, that tells you where the cell nuclei are. Um, CD45 is a marker that tells you where immune cells are. Um, EGFR and P53 are markers that report on the state of cancer cells, um, so on and so forth. Um, so again, the details um, are important. Uh, so this data is very rich. Um, analyzing it is very hard. And one of the very first things that has to be done in order to analyze it is someone has to go into these, uh, into these images and then identify where all the different cells are. Um, and so concretely what that means is that you have to go into images like this and someone has to say, okay, um, you know, these collections of pixels belong to cell number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, obviously this is, uh, you know, one challenging, um, but two, um, an exhausted task. And so, you know, usually there's any, um, you know, this step, this step is automated um, with, uh, with cell segmentation algorithms. If you're able to do this accurately, then you can do things like you know, count all of the, or quantify the different markers that are present inside every cell, uh, perform clustering to identify different cell types. And then because you have information on where um, each cell is in an image, you can uh, create these uh, spatial cell atlas images uh, like I'm showing here, uh, where we have just uh, colored the different cell populations um, in, in this image. Um, so the tumor cells are shown in purple, and then the, uh, the T cell, the different um, immune cell populations are shown in different shades of uh, orange and yellow. Um, and, you know, with this sort of information, then you can do analyses uh, in an interpretable fashion, you know, linking uh, spatial patterns to things like spatial outcome, oh, sorry, uh, patient outcomes um, and, and whatnot. Um, but at the very start of this pipeline, um, or the very start of this process, is identifying cells. And I'd say just generally speaking, um, there's been a problem um, uh, for all the analyses that have been done to date, including the ones that my lab has been a part of. And that is that we tend to use the cell nucleus as a proxy for the whole cell. Um, and this just ends up being inadequate for a wide number of regions, uh, reasons. Um, so the um, one is it's just not accurate. And so when you're quantifying markers, um, this tends to um, you know, give you relatively poor results. Um, but two, there, if there are some analyses that, you know, folks would like to be able to do that you just can't do if you're using the nucleus as a proxy for the whole cell. And this is, uh, these include um, subcellular localization analyses. Um, so identifying, you know, which compartments uh, inside of a cell does your signal live. And then there's also analyses uh, looking at the morphology of cells and tissues that folks would like to be able to do um, that can't be done if you're just doing uh, nuclear, uh, if you're just looking at the cell nucleus. Um, and so what's really needed is a robust method that can do both, both nuclear and whole cell segmentation and be robust enough so that it can be used on the wide variety of tissue types that are being imaged and the wide variety of imaging platforms that are being used uh, today in both academic and commercial labs. Um, and so that's what's needed. And the question is, how do we um, how do we get there? And in our view, the path to getting there um, is through improving the underlying data sets um, and the underlying uh, labels. And so our reasoning behind this is that uh, we've just observed over the last uh, few years we've been, we've been active in the space, that the reason why models don't, uh, deep learning models don't perform on these, on these tasks is often that the underlying uh, images themselves lack the information necessary for the models to make uh, to make uh, uh, correct decisions on about which uh, pixels belong to which cells. Um, and so this missing information can uh, show up in different ways uh, for the for these uh, tissue images. Uh, this arises a lack of contrast uh, between neighboring um, cells and tissues. Uh, we also look at uh, dynamic data sets of uh, live cell imaging movies. And in there, this uh, missing information uh, issue arises in a, in a lack of temporal information um, in the existing training data sets. Uh, most training data sets that have been uh, developed to date um, have been done on static snapshots rather than um, entire movies. Um, and so just to give an example of what I'm, uh, what, what I'm talking about here. Um, so here we have an image of a double stranded, um, of a double stranded DNA stain. So uh, the white area, uh, uh, the white areas tell you where the cell nuclei are. Um, and so what you can do is you can uh, annotate, uh, have someone annotate a collection of data like this. And they can train a deep learning model to just tell you where the boundaries of cells are, um, cell nuclei are. And if you do that, and, and then you take a said model and run it over an image like this, um, this is the output that you'll get. Um, and so what you'll see is that there are all of these gray areas 
um, inside, inside of cells. And these gray areas represent areas where the model is just unsure whether it's inside of a cell um, at the cell boundary um, or um, part of part of the uh, part of the background and the reason why it's unsure is that the the visual cues uh, in the form of contrast just aren't present in these sort of in these sort of images um, because we're dealing with these data sets where you have multiple channels there's actually an opportunity to add information back in the um, add contrast back um, so add this information back in the form of additional stains and so what one can do is you can include an additional stain where you actually actually um, get contrast between neighboring cells. And so that if you're to take that same data set where now you have both this nuclear image um, plus a image that has the contrast between neighboring cells, train, um, train a model on that data set and then run it on a similar image like this uh, that also has that um, additional stain, uh, then the results uh, end up looking like this. And so you'll see that most of the gray areas that were present in the previous, uh, previous image, they magically go away. Um, and so this is just to um, just highlights that, you know, a very viable path for improving um, performance and robustness of the of uh, machine learning methods can come from improving the information content of the underlying data that's used to train these uh, train these methods. Okay, um, and so with that, we sort of arrive at the heart of the story, um, which is that we set out um, with Mike Angelo's lab um, up at Stanford uh, to solve this problem of doing both nuclear and whole cell segmentation and tissue images uh, using uh, deep learning. So the very first thing that we did is we just surveyed all the labs who are active in the space, we're uh, actively collecting data, and we asked them con to contribute data from uh, the different instruments and the different tissue types um, that they both use, uh, use an image. Um, and as we did that, um, we made sure that each image uh, each data set that we uh, that we ingested into this collection had both a adequate nuclear image and then also an adequate uh, membrane or cytoplasmic image as well, because we need both in order to be able to uh, perform both nuclear and whole cell segmentation. And so once we compiled this data set, um, the next major challenge uh, was uh, was annotation, um, because someone has to go through these uh, this data set and label literally quite literally every pixel um, in every in every image. And so that's the challenge. Um, and so before uh, going into the details of how we did it, I would just like to show a montage of what the data looks like just to uh, visually demonstrate um, how hard this is. Um, and so here we have a collection of images from the different uh, imaging platforms and the different uh, tissue types that are represented in this data set. Um, so we have melanoma co uh, collected on uh, the multiplex ion imaging platform. We have an image from Hodgkin's lymphoma collected on the Vectra platform. Um, we have uh, breast cancer, um, small cell lung cancer, and then uh, histologically normal colon collected with uh, various types of immunofluorescence. And then we also have histologically normal uh, GI tissues uh, shown here um, that were collected on the multiplex ion beam imaging platform. And just visually speaking, you can see that this is a hard task. Um, cell morphology varies quite significantly, both uh, between and within tissues. Um, the uh, autofluorescence characteristics uh, and the signal to noise characteristics uh, vary between the different imaging platforms. Uh, in some tissues, uh, cells are sparse. In other tissues, cells are densely packed. And then also note, uh, you can note that in some tissues, most notably the GI tissues, uh, some cells don't have cell nuclei. And this is really an artifact of taking a two-dimensional cross-section through a three-dimensional object, the tissue. Um, sometimes the imaging plane just ends up missing, uh, missing the cell nucleus. Okay, and so labeling um, these sort of, uh, a large collection of these sorts of images uh, is the um, is the challenge, and so to do this, uh, we ended up developing a human in the loop approach to uh, to data to image labeling, and so rather than having a collection of experts go through and manually label these uh, these data sets. Uh, rather, we had experts, um, crowdsource workers, and uh, deep learning methods uh, work collaboratively um, to, to label a data set. And so the way this works is sort of as, is as follows. So we have three different phases. In the very first phase, experts take a um, small selection of, of this data set. Um, they label it, um, and this serves two purposes. Uh, first, it defines, uh, helps define the labeling task. Uh, the second purpose is that this uh, small, uh, uh, the small amount of training data, training data that's generated can be used to train a preliminary deep learning model um, that can process data. And so this model uh, will perform okay, but it will, but it almost certainly makes um, a considerable number of mistakes, and that's just because it hasn't seen um, enough data to be able to perform uh, reliably. Um, enough in both both the uh, sense of scale and also diversity. Um, once you have this plenary model, then you move to the second phase. And so in the second phase, 
Crowdsource workers uh, work to generate new training data by correcting model errors rather than creating uh, training data uh, from scratch. And so to generate uh, a new piece of training data, um, you start with an image, you run it through this preliminary model that produces a prediction. Um, this prediction is then sent to crowdsource workers where uh, on guidance, uh, with guidance from instructions for, uh, created by the experts, they then correct uh, the errors that uh, that appear in these uh, in these predictions. Uh, this corrected uh, these corrected data sets uh, then come back. There's quality control that's uh, done by the experts, and then uh, once the quality control is finished, uh, this training data then gets added um, to the uh, to the pile of training data. Um, your training data uh, um, grows, and so you then continue this process. Um, at some point, uh, you've collected enough new training data where it makes sense to retrain your model. And then when you retrain your model, you can then start the cycle, um, but with a new, newer, more accurate model. Uh, and so what ends up happening is you end up in this virtuous cycle uh, that you know, significantly decreases the marginal cost of annotation. Um, as you generate more and more training data, um, your model becomes more and more accurate, and your crowdsource workers need less time to generate new training data because there are fewer errors to correct because your model is more accurate. Um, and so eventually you can you end up in this third uh, third phase where you have a finished data set. Um, on this finished data set, you can train a final, uh, you know, highly accurate model, and then this uh, final model can then be uh, deployed to the broader community um, for, uh, for use. Um, and so a uh, preprint describing on um, this work is sort of is shown here um, on the bottom, on the bottom, on the bottom right. Okay, um, and so we've run this uh, process uh, on, um, on this uh, uh, tissue image collection uh, to produce a data set that we're calling TissueNet, um, which is a tissue net for multiplex tissue imaging. Um, it's the largest data, uh, data set of its kind. Um, it contains uh, nearly a 1 million uh, paired nuclear and whole cell um, annotations uh, collected across six different uh, imaging platforms and nine different, uh, nine different tissue types. Um, it took about 4,000 uh, person hours to generate this data, um, but because we were uh, generating the annotations in this distributed um, crowdsourced way, um, most of that annotation burden was, was carried by crowdsource, uh, crowdsource workers Rather than um, rather than experts. Okay, um, with these data, uh, we can then train uh, you know not just deep learning models but whole pipelines uh, that can uh, perform both nuclear and whole cell segmentation accurately across uh, these different uh, these, these uh, different uh, diverse set of tissue images. Um, and you know, I'm just showing this whole pipeline here just because this is a important point. Um, is that for uh, this sort of work, uh, it's this entire pipeline that has value, not just the deep learning model. Um, and so often, well, almost always uh, in, in the sort of work that we do, um, these deep learning models have to be put in an entire pipeline that actually produces the final outputs um, that folks uh, that folks want. Um, and so here, this pipeline has steps that do um, both normalization um, of images and then also takes care of tiling and untiling so that you can process large, uh, large, fields, uh, large fields of view. Okay, um, I just like to spend the remainder of my time uh, just taking you through a visual tour of the results. Um, so here is a tissue image uh, from uh, pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. Um, the nuclear stain is in green, membrane stain is in uh, blue. And so the white outline is a prediction um, from our algorithm uh, showing where the outline um, of the whole cells are. And you can just see visually speaking um, that, these look, uh, that these look quite nice. Uh, we spent a extensive amount of time um, benchmarking, uh, uh, benchmarking performance, um, and by our estimation, um, this uh, this algorithm, which we're calling Mesmer, is by far and away the most accurate um, algorithm for doing uh, uh, whole cell segmentation um, on tissue imaging data, um, and that's by almost any metric uh, that you can use. Um, here we're showing metrics of the F1 score, which is the harmonic. Um, the harmonic mean between re of recall and precision, but there are other metrics that we've used and um, you know, our, this algorithm is still, um, is by far and away the best um, that we've seen. Um, uh, there's additional visualizations um, uh, that, uh, that I'd like to show. Um, and so here, well, what you're going to see are uh, images uh, where we show the um, predicted uh, cell segmentation masks uh, that have been colored by the relative error in uh, cell area. Um, and so cells that are too small are shown in um, our, are colored blue 
and cells that are too large are colored are colored red. Um, and so here we have uh, a comparison of the ground truth. So everything is white and the F1 score is one, which is a perfect score. Um, and this makes sense because we're comparing ground truth with ground truth. Um, here we have a previous algorithm that our, our lab had generated called FeatureNet for doing cell segmentation. Um, you can see an F1 score of 0.66, which is okay. But when you look at it visually, um, you can just see that there's a variety of errors that happen. Um, cells get merged together to produce these large uh, red areas. And then there's also just a systematic misjudging uh, of the sizes of the size of cells. Um, here's a comparison with cell pose, another uh, published uh, algorithm, algorithm for doing a cell segmentation. Um, F1 score is 0.58. And here the main uh, failure mode is a low recall. Um, so there's just a variety of cells that um, this algorithm just misses. Um, and here we have uh, Mesmer. Um, and so we, as Mesmer gets a score, F1 score is 0.88. And uh, just visually speaking, the results are much, um, are much nicer. Uh, this slide shows uh, Mesmer's uh, best, best feature, which is the ability to generalize across tissue types, disease states, and imaging platforms. And so here we have a collection of images across uh, different um, tissue types, disease states, and imaging platforms. And here is the same visualization of the outputs of, of Mesmer um, across, this, uh, across this collection of images. And so visually, we can just see that, uh, you know, no matter what Mesmer is seeing, whether it's um, images of breast cancer, images of histologically normal skin, um, images of uh, histologically normal pancre pancreas or lung cancer, um, images taken from the MEBI platform, images taken from immunofluorescence, uh, Mesmer is able to perform cell segmentation uh, uh, very well. Um, so well, in fact, that when we actually compare Mesmer's performance uh, with human performance, uh, we are not able to notice a, uh, a difference. And there are two analyses that we've done, uh, one of them comparing Mesmer uh, to the inner annotator um, agreement. Um, and there we see no, dif uh, no difference uh, between Mesmer's performance um, and uh, the inner annotator agreement. Um, and then the second comparison is looking is taking Mesmer's performance um, and asking a, a collection of board certified pathologists in to do in a blinded fashion comparison, uh, which output would you, would you prefer? Um, what a human produce um, or what Mesmer would produce? Um, and what we see, what we've seen is that when looked at either in aggregate or broken out by the different types of tissues that are present um, in this comparison data set, um, there's no real difference um, that we observe uh, between uh, uh, as far as a preference uh, for human outputs versus Mesmer outputs. Um, and so there's a wide variety of uh, different uh, different analyses and exciting science that we're currently exploring um, with Mesmer, uh, uh, with Mesmer, uh, both in our lab and also in, with collaborations uh, uh, with uh, um, Mike's lab and then also um, some other uh, some other colleagues as well. Um, we are also um, hard at work uh, building a similar resource for live cell imaging. Um, and so here the main challenge is being able to label entire movies uh, rather than labeling uh, static frames and making sure that those labels are consistent um, throughout the entire um, the entire movie. Um, and uh, this is work that's actively in progress, uh, but we've labeled, I want to say, like on, on the same order as the number of labels as what we've done for uh, the tissue net. And with these data sets, uh, we're able to train models that can do both cell segmentation, um, but also cell tracking. Um, and so here we see a model um, that's able to both uh, segment cells, um, but also track them um, even through cell divisions. Um, and so when cells divide, um, the, the model is able to capture um, that lineage uh, that lineage information. Um, and so right now we're busy extending on um, this model so that it will, these models, so that it'll work for both fluorescent images um, as well as uh, label-free uh, imaging modalities. Um, and so that they'll be flexible enough so that when uh, you have non-canonical examples of cell division, we're still able to perform uh, perform well. Um, and so the last thing I'll, uh, the, actually I'd say the last point I'll end on is just really like what this holds for uh, the future of uh, deep learning and biological imaging. Um, and that this is the slide that really excites me the most about this work. Um, so because we've actually been building the software infrastructure for executing these, scale, uh, these labeling projects, uh, this substantially reduces the marginal cost of labeling, um, so much so that if we had to do this type of project again, um, so that if we had to produce another tissue net, 
uh, we estimate that the cost would be about twenty thousand um, dollars, and this might sound like a lot of uh, a lot of money, uh, but in the you know the biology um, scale of things, um, this is on um, on par with a medium sized sequencing experiment. And just given the the broad utility that's going to come from both these data sets and these models, uh, to us these are um, it's a no brainer that this should just be done for as many different types of biological images um, as possible. And so powering this is this uh, powering these efforts is this infrastructure that our lab has built for executing these projects. That includes uh, software for um, you know ingesting uh, data sets, um, tracking both raw data and metadata, um, tracking um, labels uh, throughout the entire um, throughout the entire um, labeling process, um, a repertoire of different models that can uh, perform different tasks, and even uh, custom labeling software uh, that, that, that can that can handle the different um, nuances uh, that come with each uh, with each uh, data set. Okay, um, and so with that, um, I believe I'm done and I'll open the floor for question. I'd like to give a huge thanks um, to the members of my lab who've been involved in this work. Um, there's absolutely no way this would have been done um, without them, and they deserve an, an immense amount of uh, uh, praise for doing um, when doing what I believe is some of the hardest stuff uh, in, this, uh, in this intersection between uh, biology and machine learning. Um, and I would also like to um, thank folks, uh, our funding organizations for supporting this work. Thank you, David. That was really fascinating. And we have a couple of questions already. Um, the first one is, do you have a sense of what makes a cell hard to outline for your model, like red cells? Are there some human defined heuristics that could be helpful in those situations? Uh, yes. So the, um, the cells that are the the cells that are the hardest to label mm -hmm. are the ones where the label is ambiguous and where uh, reasonable humans will disagree about what the label should be. Um, there, the way that we, the approach that we've taken to handling um, these, these cases is just trying to be as consistent as possible um, in the instructions that we give, uh, that we generate and the instructions that we give to, uh, to label, uh, to the crowdsourced uh, labelers. And then also uh, the processes that, uh, that are used for, uh, for quality control. Um, those are the hardest examples. Um, and I would say the best, the best solution is likely um, better, I'd say in my, in my estimation, better data. Um, so rather than looking at 2D um, images, um, having like true three-dimensional uh, three dimensional data sets um, that are, have high signal to noise, um, so these ambiguities get resolved. But we're not in the realm of perfect data uh, yet. And so we just made the judgment call to try to do the best that we can with the data sets that we have. Thank you. And the next question is, do you use UNETs as your model architecture? Do segmentation projects like you described need the notion of interpretability and how? Uh, so I, so the models themselves that we use, uh, they're related to UNETs. Uh, I'd say the technical details are we use models that have, uh, we use feature pyramid networks. Um, so we use uh, res uh, residual I believe we use uh, ResNet 50 backbones, a couple of feature pyramid networks, and then we do some upscaling operations so that we can do um, so we can do dense pixel level prediction for the whole images. Um, and then we have a ways of framing the segmentation problem so that we can do instant segmentation um, in that uh, in that way. Uh, the reason why we like this is twofold. Uh, one, feature pyramid networks uh, because we're using addition uh, to merge uh, features across spatial scales rather than concatenation. Mm -hmm. Uh, they end up using less memory. And so when you're actually deploying them um, in real world settings, uh, it, it does make things it does make things easier. Uh, the other reason is that because we use standard uh, standard backbones like ResNet, uh, like ResNet 50, um, we can use transfer learning. So we usually start with backbones that have been pre-trained on larger data sets like you mentioned it, um, for these uh, for these challenges. Um, so I actually view the segmentation uh, project as part of a larger effort to build interpretable machine learning systems for biological imaging data. Um, it's entirely possible to build machine learning systems that don't use segmentation at all and will take you straight from images to you know whatever output you want whether it's you know classification representation learning etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, by filtering things through this single cell lens uh, in our view that gives like a much needed um, injection of interpretability um, because it'll let you um, it'll let you sort of assess you know what's you know what role you know cell to cell variability actually plays um, in the things that you end up um, at, that you end up uh, extracting um, and I see one more question from Yisong. Um, 
does comparing human to human agreement versus human to ML agreement hide the unexpectedness of the disagreements? Um, I, I would say no. Um, and the reason why I'd say no is that prior, uh, prior to this work for tissue imaging, no one had actually looked at how well do experts agree for this uh, for this problem? Um, and I would say like we we were surprised, or so like I was surprised uh, for some of the data sets that you know we thought were you know fairly um, say fairly straightforward. Um, there was actually like a wide, uh, fairly wide, or a non-trivial amount of disagreement um, between experts. Um, and so I don't view this as sort of hiding the. Um, Hiding this disagreement, uh, disagreements is all. Um, the way I sort of, the way I like to contextualize it, um, is that this, uh, this sort of demonstrates that both people and the models are sort of sampling from the space of reasonable segmentations.